And we wanted to, don't want to leave this list without the orexin antagonist. I'm going to try to pronounce this one. Suvorexant, how'd I do on that one? Sounds good to me. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Where is that? Uh, sure. So I think what's interesting about this agent, it's a new mechanism of action, right? So in the fact that it really inhibits that uh, wake um, cycle in terms of using uh, the orexant receptor antagonist. So there's two different re type of re orexant receptor antagonists. So by blocking them, it improves that uh, uh, disruption of the sleep-wake cycle. So I know I'm not a sleep physician, but I think I got that pretty close in terms of the pharmacologic implications of it. Right. Yeah. As you know, orexin is more of an activating neurotransmitter, we mm -hmm. think, yeah. uh, along with many other uh, arousing neurotransmitters. Orexin may also have a different role in stabilizing the relationship between sleep and wakefulness. Nevertheless, uh, by antagonizing the orexin activating system, these drugs purportedly, or we think that's how they work, uh, seem to promote the onset of sleep. Exactly. Now, that puts that one in a different class, right? The others are more global. Sleep is either a consequence of some side effect of the drug or it's globally sedative. But the orexant inhibitors seem to be directed at arousal sensors or arousal receptor points, which is a different mechanism, yeah? Am I wrong? Well, certainly, it, it's a different mechanism. Well, they're all the, the benzodiazepine class of medicines, the, the melatonin, the antihistamines. They're all, even the antihistamine targets a specific neurotransmitter system in, in okay. the brain that's involved with wakefulness. And, and orexin is yet a different one and may have slightly different properties than all the, uh, of the others. Are any of these drugs uh, preferred for treating insomnia, specifically in the elderly? I think it gets back to uh, what exactly are we treating and what are the comorbidities, right? Um, so I think as we look at some of the new newer agents, the suvorexant, you know, and how it's being studied and maybe certain patient populations of older adults, there may be some safety signals. I think we're, we'll discuss that, I think, a little bit further in this program. I would be cautious in saying one is preferred. I think it's really important to look at what's going on with the patients um, and very, very judicious in choosing one versus the other um, because of the comorbidities. So I, I, and even within the guidelines, um, they show really discussion about what is the harms and benefits and the limited benefits with these medications. And they don't come out and say one is preferred um, in older adults, um, but we do talk about some coexisting comorbidities where an agent may be preferred because of the underlying pharmacologic activities and properties. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's too early to tell. I mean, the data mm -hmm. with the benzodiazepines and the, B and the Z drugs, uh, which, which led to the cautions regarding usage with the elderly in particular, uh, um, were gathered along the course of many years and even decades. And it's really too early to tell whether these newer drugs with newer mechanisms may or may not have that same sort of baggage after many, many years of use. Have any of these drugs been specifically studied in the elderly? in terms of their effect on sleep and improvement of, of insomnia? And I see there's someone smiling. No, well, I, th I think the question is, is that in a systematic study of these things in, in peer-reviewed right. journals, That's what I'm randomized at. controlled mm -hmm. trials and so forth, and one of the times the big problems is that you never see studies where they compare different drugs uh, across di different classes like this, at least th none that I'm aware of. And so it, it's very difficult to get, and I think that Nicole's point about sort of each case almost has to, you have to look at the, the various comorbidities of the patient, uh, the, the positioning of the medication, in, in some cases even the cost of the medications, and, and balance that against you know, what the needs are, what's available. Well, what, am, what am I missing here? I've heard earlier in this broadcast that insomnia affects perhaps 70% of people, and as you grow older it's common, more common. And if this were heart disease, cancer, infectious disease, there would be a raft of controlled, double-blinded studies in the elderly, in young people. Why isn't there the same kind of literature for sleep medications? Because it's, it's considered a lifestyle. Yeah. Why? Uh, it's considered a lifestyle problem. You're pointing at him. <laughs> yes. Well, it's his fault? Yes. He's an insurance person. <laughs> you know, oh, I've got to tell you. I don't often wind up defending insurance companies, but this is a blunt attack. <laughs> I mean, look. Head, I, head, I was going to say, head-to-head -head yeah. comparisons are almost never done in the first place. Okay. The second place, all most of the drugs that we're talking about, uh, except for some of the very newest ones, are essentially free. 
they're, they're cheap, and so nobody is going to invest uh, in clinical trials. So that's kind of the reason why we don't have the information. The, end, the endpoints are nebulous at best. So okay, and they don't need prior authorization mostly, but let me, let me take this from the, the other perspective, from a payer's perspective now. Um, someone comes to you and says, I'm having trouble sleeping. And my doctor, or the doctor calls you and says, we want to prescribe A, B, or C, and some of these things are expensive or more expensive than others, which are, as you put it, relatively free. Are you going to insist on step therapy? Or are you going to say, you know what, this is a better drug, let's just go to it? It really depends on what the consumer has purchased in terms of their formulary. Um, I deal almost exclusively with Medicare, and our company has eight different Medicare formularies. They range from what we call lean to robust. The lean ones are very restrictive, have step therapy. The robust formularies, um, pretty much you get what, what you ask for and everything in between. So it really, it, it, there's not a simple answer to your question because it really depends on what the consumer has purchased. What I'm looking for, and I'm getting a bad feeling that I'm not going to get, is is there a rational scientific hierarchy on all of these plans to say, look, you've got A, we're going to start with drug A, and then go on to B, and then go on to C, because I've got data and I've got research. Or is it, ah, oh, you paid more, you get more? I, th I th you know, the simple answer is it's the latter. Really? Really? That's it? Does that make sense to you? Is it, is it a description of what happens, or does it make sense? Does it, well, well you pick your, pick your poison. two different questions. Right, I know. <laughs> I just want to make sure that, well, I think that that's, I think what happens has a lot to do with, with the, the, the perspectives of the individual clinician okay. and how they approach insomnia and how they deal with their patients and, and, and the complexities of their own individual patients. Um, I think that, although I would, I would bet that We've never discussed it particularly, but I bet you Carl and I would more or less value, put equal value on a lot of these medications, but we may choose one or two before the other. Um, and it all depends on the peculiarities of the patient. But, but I guess there is no algorithm. There's no hard, fast algorithm. And when you choose one or two rather than some of the others, is that because of hard clinical trial information or is it your personal experience? Oh, for me? Well, both. You know, part of it has to do with what's the data that's available. The problem is, as you've already pointed out, when it gets down to the data, it's interesting when the American County of Sleep Medicine sort of came out with their practice parameters about how to use the drugs that were available at the time. They looked at both the ones that are FDA approved and the ones that are not. And pretty much all the drugs that had FDA approval wound up in the column of recommended for use, weak. All the ones that were commonly used, trazodone, even I think, I forget, melatonin may have been on that list, were on the column of recommended to not use, weak. But the fact that somebody paid enough money to get those studies done, I think really dictated the difference between those two columns. 